One of the first international videos I did on this channel was on Melbourne, and that's because the city holds a special place in my heart, with its trams and trains, both forming enormous networks. Melbourne's train system in particular has nearly 450 kilometers of lines and over 200 stations, covering all areas of the city, with a dazzlingly complex web of rail lines that can be confusing to even try and understand. So let's break it down and see what makes Melbourne's rail network tick. If you're new here, my name is Reese, and I make videos about public transport systems around the world and at home here in Canada. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video, it really helps. To get us started, here is the massive Melbourne Suburban Rail Network, which is known as Metro Trains Melbourne, in the great tradition of Australian metro systems that aren't actually metro systems, and it's currently operated by MTR, as in Hong Kong's actual metro system. Supplementing Metro Trains Melbourne is the V-Line Regional Rail, which shares tracks with Metro Trains in places and services the broader area of regional Victoria extending hundreds of kilometres from Melbourne, with a mix of slick DMUs known as Velocity sets, along with some much less slick locomotives and carriages. I did an explainer video on Sydney a few months back, and I started it by talking about the actual trains that operate on the network. This is a good spot to start, also because Melbourne only uses a few types of trains across its entire massive network, which is fully electrified with 1500 volt DC overhead wires just like Sydney. Now, unlike Sydney, which uses standard gauge tracks, and Perth and Brisbane, which use narrow gauge, Melbourne uses broad 1600mm or 5 foot 3 inch gauge, except for one line on V-Line, but again, that's a future video. If you're curious, this is because different parts of Australia's rail networks grew out of separate colonies. Currently, the network operates four different types of single-level electric multiple unit trains, which are as follows. Firstly, the ComEng sets built by the defunct Australian rail manufacturer of the same name in the 1980s. Then the Siemens and Alstom trains, which were first introduced in the 2000s as part of the privatization and division in two of Melbourne's rail system. The Siemens trains are actually from the Siemens Modular Metro family, making them distant cousins of the metro trains used in Vienna and Oslo, while the Alstom trains are from the Extrapolis family, with similar sets actually being used in Chile. The newest model of trains on the network is the HCMT, or High Capacity Metro Train, which was manufactured by a consortium including CRRC and is meant to supplant the Comeng sets. The HCMT, like the Comeng and Alstom sets, has three doors per side per car, but unlike older models that came in three car sets generally paired into six car trains and sometimes split apart during low demand periods, the HCMT sets come in seven car, fully open gangway trains. The HCMTs will also be supplemented by updated Alstom trains, known as the Extrapolis 2.0, which will be delivered in the mid-2020s in a six car configuration. Now, before we talk in detail about the network, let's talk about the city so you can get familiar with some of the various focal points and major connections on the rail network. This is Port Phillip Bay, the massive bay which Melbourne is situated around. And this is the CBD, or Central Business District, where most of Melbourne's many skyscrapers and impressive skyline is rooted. However, lots of the growth and the tallest buildings in the city are located in the growing South Bank area, on the south bank of the Yarra River, which runs through a large part of southern Victoria and Melbourne itself. To the west is the Docklands area, which despite being home to lots of new post-industrial development, is not to be confused with these ones. Within the Docklands is Marvel Stadium, yes, that Marvel. To the east of the CBD is the Jollymont area, which used to be home to major train yards, but is now home to a number of arenas and fields, the largest of which, the MCG, or Melbourne Cricket Ground, is a 100,000 seat stadium where the typical event has a 90 plus percent transit mode split with a number of tram and train lines running through the area. Melbourne is also the capital of the state of Victoria, and Parliament is located on the eastern side of the CBD. The city's two main train stations lie on the west and south of the CBD and are Southern Cross and Flinders Street respectively, with Southern Cross being adjacent to the Docklands and Flinders Street being across the river from South Bank. Melbourne Airport is the city's international hub, and is situated roughly 20 kilometers northwest of the CBD, and is not served by the rail network, unlike in Perth, Brisbane and Sydney, though there is a high quality frequent bus service. Now, Melbourne's trams have come up a few times, and they are the primary mode of transit in the central parts of the city, although they do extend far from the centre. While this is by no means an explainer on the trams, though if you'd like that, leave a comment, it is worth noting that Melbourne has the world's largest tram network, and unlike the suburban trains, this network has standard gauge tracks. More relevant to us, the Port Melbourne and St Kilda lines were both originally suburban rail lines and were converted in the 1980s for tram operation. 
you can still very clearly see the rail alignments on a map, and on the ground you can see the old catenary portals and station structures and platforms. Not to mention the old bridge which took the trains that served these lines over the Yarra River to Flinders Street, which is now a pedestrian bridge. The most complex part of the Melbourne Rail Network is arguably the CBD, so let's address it last and start with the various lines that shoot off into the suburbs. Unlike Sydney, the Melbourne Suburban Network is basically entirely radial, and so services don't come together outside of the CBD, which is almost shocking given how extensive the network is. There is a project known as the Suburban Rail Loop that's meant to address this, but I won't be talking about it in detail in this video, as it will be an independent automated metro line not under the Metro Trains Melbourne banner. Suffice to say that this is a major gap, and it's positive that plans are underway to fill it. The various branches of Melbourne's suburban rail system are organized into groups, based on their shared approach tracks into central Melbourne, which are important for how trains move into and around the CBD, and are organized as such. The first group for our purposes are the Frankston, Werribee, and Williamstown lines, which run from the southeast at Frankston to and through the CBD via Richmond, which serves the Jollymont area, as well as Flinders Street and Southern Cross and then west and southwest, with tracks branching to Williamstown to the south and Werribee to the west, with a number of flat junctions. If you're wondering, the loop south to Altona is single track with passing loops, as with most such alignments in Melbourne, and is used by local services, while the northern alignment is used by express trains that bypass Altona entirely. Now, remember how I said the Metro Trains Melbourne network was entirely electrified? Well, that is true short of the Stony Point line, which uses a two-car DMU borrowed from V-Line to shuttle back and forth along an exclusively single-track line between Frankston and the ferry dock at Stony Point every two hours or so. Interestingly, during peak periods, the train splits to operate a more frequent service in the peak direction before coupling back up and returning as a pair. The next group includes the Sunbury, Craigieburn, and Upfield lines, which run from the CBD to the north and northwest. These lines all share their corridors or tracks with much longer distance V-line services that act as a regional overlay, extending to locations such as Geelong, Ballarat, and Bendigo. For the most part, where capacity is tight, short V-line services stay out of the way of metro ones, but the flat junctions at Sunshine as well as adjacent to North Melbourne can get rather messy. Also flat is the connection to the two-stop Flemington Racecourse special events line off of the Craigieburn line, the latter of which has parallel standard gauge tracks for trains to New South Wales and other destinations for part of its length. In addition, the final stretch of the Upfield line, which almost saw a similar tram conversion fate to the St Kilda and Port Melbourne lines, is single-tracked. To the northeast of Melbourne are the Mernda and Hurstbridge lines, which are quite lightly used relative to other lines. Starting in the CBD, the lines pass north through Jollymont continuing up to Clifton Hill, where they split at a flat junction, with the Mernda line heading mostly north and the Hurstbridge line heading northeast. The Hurstbridge line has a large amount of single track, albeit undergoing duplication, limiting frequency to every 20 minutes or so, which sort of reminds me of some of the S-Bahn lines in Berlin. The line also features a long wooden trestle and a very rural setting, particularly towards the end, which is very pleasant. The Mernda line, by comparison, is all double-tracked, and was extended to Mernda, including along some elevated viaducts as well as two other new stations in 2018. The most heavily branched group of lines in Melbourne head off to the east from the CBD, passing through Richmond, which is a significant shoulder station, located just south of the stadiums and fields in Jollymont. This group includes the Lilydale, Belgrave, Alamein, and Glen Waverley lines, which fan out across eastern Melbourne, splitting from several others that head south after passing Richmond. Unusually for Melbourne, the split between the Glen Waverley and other lines, as well as between the Alamein and Lilydale and Belgrave lines happen with flying junctions, and also of note the Lilydale, Belgrave and Alamein lines all end in single track sections, of varying lengths, and share a triple track section from Burnley to Box Hill, which despite having platforms on all tracks at each station, does allow some limited express services to operate. The final real group of services are the Cranbourne and Packingham lines, which run from the CBD through Richmond to Melbourne southeast, running parallel to the Frankston line until Caulfield, before splitting apart at Dandenong with a flat junction beyond the station, enabling the Cranbourne line to head southeast while the Packingham line turns east. Both the Cranbourne and Packingham lines have seen very heavy use in recent years as Melbourne's southeastern quadrant has grown precipitously. The last line we need to mention, and it is just a short single unbranched line, is the Sandringham line which runs from Flinders Street in the CBD through Richmond to South Yarra, where it splits from the Frankston, Cranbourne, and Pakenham lines to run south to a terminal near the coast of Port Phillip Bay. So now that we know where all the lines go in the suburbs, let's talk about where they go in the CBD, and who better to talk about that than a knowledgeable local? Hi, my name's Martin, and I run a transport channel called Tateset here in Melbourne. 
Our two big CBD stations, Flinders Street and Southern Cross, are connected by the Flinders Street Viaduct, and in the early days, most trains ran through on cross city routes. In the 1920s, Flinders Street was said to be the busiest railway station in the world, and that pressure wasn't eased until the early 80s when the underground city loop was built, running around the north and east of the CBD with three new stations. The layout of the loop is quite unusual. It's made up of four separate single track tunnels, each carrying a group of lines. Because of this, some tunnels are busier than others, and each group can only operate around the loop in one direction at any given time. But what's really odd is that on weekdays, two of the tunnels actually change direction halfway through the day. This all creates a complex pattern of operation that's quite hard to memorise and can be super confusing for passengers. Some lines avoid the loop, with the Werribee, Williamstown and Frankston lines through running over the viaduct, and the Sandringham line runs into Flinders Street only. Despite how it looks on the map, there are also some trains which don't run into the CBD at all. The Alla Main line is operated as a shuttle during off-peak times, connecting with city trains at Camberwell, and it's a similar story with the Williamstown line, which operates as a shuttle to Newport at certain times of day. These shuttles are the last place three-car trains operate anywhere on the network. For the full story on how the city loop works, you can jump over to my channel and watch a detailed explainer. Thank you, Reese. Thanks, Martin. All of this infrastructure across Melbourne and through the CBD means a lot of different services can be operated, and one of my favourite aspects of the system is that, like in many European cities such as Copenhagen, 24-hour service is operated on almost the entire network on Friday and Saturday nights. While night service is great, all of that centralised infrastructure and interlining with flat junctions that we've been talking about does have a downside, and that's that Melbourne's rail network can have some serious reliability issues. This is compounded by the very large number of grade crossings that exist across the network, including between trams and trains in a few locations. Fortunately, the grade crossings are being removed at a frantic pace, thanks to the quite popular Level Crossing Removal Project, which is removing some of the tram train crossings, as well as a number of groups of and individual level crossings across the city. These projects come with varied approaches, from dropping tracks below roadways to lowering the roadway itself, and often station rebuilds and other infrastructure upgrades are also included which helped to turn the sometimes dated feeling suburban rail infrastructure into something that feels more like modern rapid transit. Probably the most iconic form of grade separation is the sky rail approach, that's often used when a number of grade crossings need to be removed in quick succession. In these instances, rail lines are elevated above ground, often with new above ground stations, and public parks and greenways are created in place of the previous at-grade rail line. Even cooler, in some instances, the elevated tracks have been built directly above the still running at grade line, which shows that the Skyrail approach could probably be used in a lot of places, even when demand is significant. Now, a system with less level crossings is not all Melburnians have to look forward to, as a lot of different projects are coming together to fix issues with the rail network of today, and build an even better one for the future. One of the most important projects for Melbourne will be the addition of a new air rail link line that will split off from the Sunbury line, with a flying junction, just north of Sunshine Station, to follow an existing freight line most of the way to the airport, adding a new station in the Keelor East area on the way, before the new corridor goes elevated to pop over the Western Ring Road to terminate at a grand elevated station adjacent to the airport terminal, that reminds me of a much bigger version of the station at Toronto's airport. This new connection will mean modern HCMT trains running directly from Melbourne's airport to the city centre in about 30 minutes every 10 minutes, finally filling this gap. At the same time, the airport will become a major connection point on the suburban rail loop, with the option for passengers to head east to other suburban centres without travelling through the CBD. As it turns out, there's a much bigger project also going on as we speak that will completely change Melbourne's rail network, and that's the Metro Tunnel. The Metro Tunnel is a new 9 km long north-south tunnel through Melbourne's CBD, which will add three new stations at Arden, Parkville and Anzac, and major new interchanges at Flinders Street Town Hall and Melbourne Central State Library. As you might expect, the tunnel, which reminds me of the Elizabeth Line tunnels in a number of ways, will allow for much faster service across the CBD than is currently possible, and all stations will feature platform screen doors. And, as it turns out, Melbourne's HCMT trains can be even larger than the Class 345 trains used on the Elizabeth Line, being wider and extendable to up to 10 cars long, something which the new Metro Tunnel stations will be ready for from day one. Services from the Cranbourne and Packingham lines will enter the tunnel just east of South Yarra Station, which unfortunately won't have a connection to the line, and emerge to the northwest of the CBD along the Sunbury Line just west of North Melbourne, enabling much increased frequency and capacity on all three lines, while also isolating them from various other services. 
Since the Metro Tunnel will connect onto the Sunbury Line, airport rail services will also benefit from the high quality direct connection to the CBD, but also beyond to the city southeast. And the benefits are not just limited to the four lines that will have direct service through the Metro Tunnel, as the removal of the Cranbourne and Packingham lines from the city loop will allow for more frequency and isolation for other services. The Frankston line, for example, will be moved into the city loop at all times, while the Werribee and Williamstown lines will instead run through to Sandringham. At the same time, the Craigieburn and Upfield lines will be able to split the capacity once used by the Sunbury line. Slots freed up on the Cranbourne and Packingham lines could even be used to create a new service from the CBD to South Yarra and Richmond, helping to reduce congestion on other services passing through these hubs. All in all, Melbourne's big suburban rail network is getting a little bit bigger, and a whole lot better. From more modern stations, signalling, and trains, to less interlining, less level crossings, and less delays. I'd imagine that in a decade or two, the network will be unrecognizable. Thanks to Adam, Declan, Martin, Thomas, and Under the Clocks for providing on-the-ground footage for this video.